We love our weekly visit with the great Peter King, Odyssey NFL insider. Good evening, Peter. Thank you for coming on. How are you? Good evening, man. And I need to ask this question. There's two questions to ask before we start. Number one, did Ohio State... <laughs> really just get named the best college football team in the country. And again, I need to ask this because I am ignorant and I don't watch a lot of college football and all that. And I get it. That's the first question. But the second question, did someone really ask Kyle Shanahan if (laughs) Brock Purdy should still be the starting quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers? And so, and so th- th- let's just let's start before we get to Chase Young. We've got to spend at least two sentences on each of those topics. I, but anyway, I, yeah, I, I know. You I, guys go. No, I you know what, Peter? This is total flip mode. No, yeah, Peter, Peter's, I mean, Peter's interviewing us. This is amazing. <laughs> I'd love. I'd Thanks love, for having us, no. Mr. King. Yeah, exactly. I would love to answer both of those. First of all, I mean, the, the quick answer to your first question is yes. That did just happen. I know you meant that in a little bit more of a rhetorical way. We've decided that Georgia should still be number one, and some analytics are now telling us they shouldn't be. Go figure. I don't get it either. I think we've got more insight on your second question. Peter, I'll share something with you and now our audience. No joke. An hour ago, I said to our whole team, I said, do we even want to play the sound and bring up the whole thing that happened about asking Kyle Shanahan whether or not he's going to bench his quarterback. And the reason I asked should we bring it up is because in this city, we all know, in fact, when I heard that the question got asked, before I actually heard the audio, when I heard that the question got asked, I went, I know exactly who asked it. I, you don't even need to tell me. I know who asked it. He's a complete bleep starter. He does it on purpose. And I, I, I asked our guy, should we play it? Because when we play it, we give him undue promotion. And so that also answers your question in terms of why it got asked. All right. So I guess I, and look, we are in a free for all society. Um, and I do, Hey, look on Monday in my column, I named as one of my two goats of the week, and I mean goats, I mean a guy who blew the game. So I I named Brock Purdy, along with Graham Gano of the New York Giants, as one of my two goats of the week. So he deserves to be criticized for his play, absolutely unequivocally. However, however, (laughs) I mean, to say that Brock Purdy should legitimately deserve to be benched or should he be benched is, is just really, I don't want to, whatever the word is, it's wrong. It's idiotic, whatever it is. But I think the thing that is most notable about that question and about that concept is that that society, that is the society we're living in. Okay. And Brock Purdy in, in the last, two fourth quarters has done some bad things. And look, we can talk about why he's done the bad things. Does it have anything to do with him being, uh, you know, concussed or, or, or getting hit in the head or whatever, how, whatever it is, my whole thing about that. And I have empathy for it is if you are on the field, you are playing and you deserve, if you make a bad play, to be criticized for it. So that is how I look at that. If Whatever the reason why he made some bad throws at the end of the game against Minnesota and in the last 16 minutes, two bad throws against Cincinnati. Okay, so it, one of which wasn't even a throw. It was, I don't even know what you would call it, you know, the first interception, but whatever, he deserves to be criticized. But this is a guy who does not deserve uh, to be questioned about whether he should be benched. I would have been absolutely shocked, absolutely shocked if Kyle Shanahan gave that any air. He didn't. So we all move on. But 
be that as it may, I think everybody should understand that Brock Purdy has done enough in his first uh, 12 months as a starting quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers to say, essentially, he's made enough great throws that when he makes four or five really bad ones, that we have to just say, okay, let's take the bye. Let's everybody take a deep breath. Let's everybody get refreshed for the last nine weeks of the football season or whatever it is. And let's plan for some better football starting at Jacksonville when they come out of the bye. Peter King here on 95.7 The Game. Now, I don't want to be a hot taker when I ask this, but a lot of callers and a lot of conversation around here has been around Steve Wilkes and his yep. ability to retain his position. How much does Kyle Shanahan have to take a hard look at that spot, or is it just a situation where they need to do some retooling? You know, in my opinion, when I look at what has happened with this defense, um, and again, I, I do not think that it is smart to say, okay, um, let's talk about replacing, you know, a coordinator or anything like that, because I don't think that is what is required here in any way, shape, or form. What I think is required is to have some intelligent looks at what exactly is happening, you know, with this team at this time. I think there are two things to look at when you look at this defense, okay? And again, look, I believe that a lot of people could look at this defense now and could say, hey, look, let's all look at the numbers involved. And let's just say, for instance, that we still really believe in this defense because until the Bengals put up 31, they they have not been shredded. The shrapnel has not been horrible. And a big part of this is that the offense has put up 17 three weeks in a row, and that's not enough. <clears throat> but – I think uh, the two points I would make is that are that number one, Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch had a very long talk last late last February, early May. And they both basically said, listen, let's go get Javon Hargrave and let us build the kind of defense that even when our offense isn't playing great, that they can win a game. Okay. And again, I am not someone who believes, essentially, that sacks are the be-all, end-all of, uh, you know, of, of how you determine the success or failure of a team. But what I would say is that 18 sacks in eight games stinks. And we can talk about pressures. And look at these pressure numbers. They're great. Bill Parcells once had this point. And it became something a little bit laughable. But his point was very simple. Don't tell me how tough the labor was. Did you deliver the baby? And is the baby healthy? Okay, so I don't necessarily want to hear about all the pressures they're getting. I want to hear how often they're getting home. And I want to hear in these three games that the 49ers have lost, in which the offense has been mediocre. Okay, even though they've had some injuries, the offense has been mediocre. I want to know, let's just talk about the points you've given up on defense. And these points that you've given up, uh, you've given up, I think it's 72 or whatever it is in the three games. I mean, sometimes the defense is going to have to win a game. And they made a move to reinforce the defense today, getting Chase Young, which is fine. Okay, but John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan, I believe, have to be shocked that they had to go out and do that now because the defense has been good. 
you know, but it hasn't been overwhelming. It just hasn't. And so I guess I would, I would look at everything that's happened and I would say that, you know, everybody shares blame when you lose three in a row and the offense clearly hasn't been what it was. And Brock Purdy needs to take responsibility for being, especially in the last two games, uh, an average player at best. But this defense has got to be better. And I don't know what Kyle Shanahan does. I don't know if he walks in and says to Steve Wilkes, I want you to do X, Y, and Z. But I wouldn't blame him if he did. Peter King with us, Willard and Dibbs, every single week on 95.7 The Game. Peter, that's a hell of a comment. I think a really good one with the idea that they've got to be shocked that they had to add to an already stacked defensive line. That said, let's hear more from you on that. What is your reaction to the acquisition of Chase Young? What they've done essentially is uh, they have spent – one of their, I believe, right, it's going to be one of their three third-round picks for a, uh, you know, a nine-week rental of Chase Young, who, uh, according to Next Gen, is has the fifth most pressures in the NFL so far this year. They're probably not going to re-sign him long-term, uh, they just can't re-sign everybody who they want to. But you have to ask yourself, is the 98th pick in the, in the 2024 draft worth a an eight- or nine-week rental of a player? I would argue that it probably is. Unfortunately, that it probably is. And the reason is, if you ask the Los Angeles Rams right now, two years ago at the trade deadline, they traded a two and a three for Von Miller. And everybody just said, oh, my God. For a half season, they rented a really good pass rusher. That's way too much. They way overpaid. The Rams are crazy. <clears throat> I would argue that if, if you could tell me right now that at the trading deadline right now, you know, is it a smart move if the 49ers win the Super Bowl to only have Chase Young for half a season and the playoffs? Are you kidding me? If he helps you win games, it's a brilliant move. And just like Von Miller, everybody, everybody at the time said that's a ridiculous ransom to pay. But, you know, you ask Stan Kroenke right now. He, he sits there in his office, wherever his office is, and he looks over at the duplicate Lombardi trophy and he said, Hey, that's pretty cool. Ask Kevin Demoff if, you know, the president of the team, if the Lombardi trophy that is sitting in his LA home, wherever he lives in LA, that he can look at longingly, if that's worth it, you're damn right. It's worth it. So, so I, I, I think that especially because, most likely they're going to get a compensatory pick in return for, you know, for uh, Chase Young, wherever else he signs. It's fine. But in my opinion, I, I think it's a little weird that they had to go do this. And, and honestly, another time, another day, John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan might have said, might, 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 that, Let's go get Jalen Johnson for what we had to pay for, uh, you know, for, for Chase Young. Or, or let's go get Rasul Douglas, you know, for a little bit less maybe than we had to pay. I mean, because this team is not without problems in the secondary. So I guess I, guess I look at it and say, it's okay. It, it's, and it's probably a good move. But... I mean, if, if you thought after you got Javon Hargrave and signed Nick Bosa that you were going to have to go and make this, I don't even want to call it an urgent signing, whatever you want to call it, at the trade deadline for one of the best edge guys in the game, I think they might have said, are you kidding me? Do you realize how much we have spent, you know, to fortify the defensive line? I don't know. I, I would look at it and say – I understand why they did it, and it's not a horrible move, but 
I, I don't think that they ever thought they were going to have to do this, especially after they they signed Hargrave and gave Nick Bosa a, gi- a giant contract. It certainly is curious, and the three-game slide has coincided with the defense becoming a little bit porous, and all those things collectively with a couple of Brock Purdy mistakes. Have you lost any enthusiasm as it pertains to the Niners and being a real threat to be a factor in January? Not really, um, because what I look at when I look at the 49ers is, look, if, if it would be one thing if you looked at the 49ers and said that Trent Williams and uh, uh, it, that, that, that Trent Williams and Debo Samuel are going to be out for the year. But nobody is saying that. I, I just think that teams sometimes get hurt during the course of the season. And you have to look at what sort of injuries are they. Are they really serious injuries? Or are you going to get these guys back? Honestly, I am still really bullish on the 49ers. I think I, I, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. I believe the 49ers will be in the NFC championship game. I don't know if they'll win it, but I believe they'll be in the NFC championship game. The players on that defense are too good. The offense is too good. And particularly, I think, and I probably like the quarterback more than most, I've just seen the quarterback make too many good plays too often to think that he is what he is based on two bad second halves. Peter King with us on Willard and Dibbs, 95-7 the game. So, Peter, let's explore then how we got here. You can still be bullish, but how did the 49ers go from 5-0 and and everybody thinking they're the best team in football to what we've seen in the last three weeks? I think it's pretty simple. I think it's that if you're not whole on offense and two of your best four or five players are either missing or wounded, um, every team in the NFL is going to be affected other than, let's say, uh, I, I, I mean, uh, let's, let's say for the sake of argument, okay, that the Philadelphia Eagles – don't have Jordan Maylotta and don't have AJ Brown. And honestly, and, and I think the Jalen Hurts comparison to, uh, to Brock Purdy, I like Jalen Hurts a lot better than I like Purdy. But the fact is Jalen Hurts right now is wounded. He's gimpy. He's got a bad knee and he's playing through it. So, but so whatever that tends to equalize things. If you told me that, the Eagles did not have their left tackle and didn't have the best receiver in football right now, or he and Justin Jefferson and Tyreek Hill are one, a one B and one C, whatever it is. If you told me they were going to be without them, I would say to you, uh, I think the Eagles lose to Dallas this weekend. And I think the Eagles probably would have lost one or two games more so far over the last, whatever, you know, three weeks. So I guess I look at this and say, essentially, honestly, that I'm still bullish on them because I think you have to look at the team that they're putting out on the field. It is a wounded team, but I don't think it is a deceased team. Kyle Shanahan has never led his team back from an eight-point or greater deficit entering the fourth quarter. Is his system not designed to lead teams back, or is this just one of those tough luck random stats? I mean, I heard that stat, and I don't, and I think it is an interesting, semi valid stat. I, I, I don't think it's a bad stat, but I, I mean, I bet, I just bet there are five or six other stats you can look at to say, oh, my God, the 49ers are really, really good at X, Y, and Z. So, and again, I I love stats, and I do think that has some meaning. 
But I think part of the meaning of that is, you know, Kyle Shanahan, I want you to tell me, has he had in any of those games, any of those games, a top 10 quarterback in the NFL? And I think what I would say is probably he's never had one. Jimmy Garoppolo was never one. Uh, and Brock Purdy may end up being one. Um, and I believe a month ago, I would argue that he was one, but he certainly doesn't look like one right now based on the last two second halves. I still think Brock Purdy is good, but I think what that statistic says to me is you have a quarterback like Joe Burrow who can bring your team back when everything looks like it's doom and gloom. Peter, uh, in, in, in sort of building on the comments that you made earlier about the defense, you may or may not be aware, Steve Wilkes has been a major talking point here even before the game against the Bengals. And, and, and my take is there's got to be something bigger than just players disappointing. You can't have this collection of talent and have them all at once just start playing poorly. So what's your take on on the idea that, that Steve Wilkes is, is taking some criticism here. I think he should take some criticism um, because look right now, honestly, every coach in the NFL uh, gets credit when his unit does well, or his team does well and gets criticized when his unit or his team doesn't do well. And so I don't knock that. And, and honestly, Steve Wilkes set himself up by playing a cover zero blitz that you could argue that if he played that normally, the San Francisco 49ers would not have lost three in a row. They would have right now lost two out of three. So again, I'm not, I'm not, criticizing this honestly i'm not i'm not making a point that he deserves every bit of criticism but what i am saying i think overall is that if a coach makes a bad call you know then all of a sudden he's not a genius anymore and and you know i mean i you guys will be familiar with this so robert sala was went through a couple of years in San Francisco where he could do no wrong. Uh, you know, every game I remember I charted one game, how many times, whatever network it was, might've been ESP. I, I forget what it was, but he was in a prime time game and he was shown his, his face was shown more often than Kyle Shanahan or whoever the coach was that they played against that day. Because, you know, he was, you know, here's the new genius. Here's the guy. So now if Robert Sala, you know, basically says that uh, Zach Wilson's our guy, I have total faith in him, all that stuff. Wait a second. Right? Isn't, he, isn't he a genius? Shouldn't we trust him? How can he be saying this stuff about Zach Wilson? So he deserves the criticism now. That's, that's the point. So, so I guess what I would say about Steve Wilkes is that he, I think Steve Wilkes is a good NFL coach. I think he's a good coordinator, but we've seen it. We have seen it the last three weeks, you know, and a little bit before then in some games. Okay. You know, we've seen him give up that defense, give up too many points to the Bengals, too many points to the Vikings. And, you know, at some point, if you're a genius, if you're a great coordinator, you've got to take some responsibility. Steve Wilkes needs to take his share for a defense that has been good, but certainly not consistently great. Peter, does Roger Goodell hate the West Coast? And if he doesn't, why would he put Kansas City and Miami and Frankfurt so we have to get up at 6 in the morning? It's a, it's, it's a really long story, and I don't, <laughs> think it's a, I don't think it's a mistake. And I'll tell you why. If you read my column this week, I explained 
why this game is in Frankfurt. I'm pouring over it, and your explanation was incredible in its detail, and all I took away is that Roger Goodell hates me. No. Well, let's put it this way. 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 If the other option for this team was taken, and it was Kansas City against Detroit, okay, I might argue, might, 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 maybe not definitely, but I might argue, why in the world are you giving, uh, why in the world are you taking away a game with six and two Detroit against six and two Kansas city. What a horrible move by the NFL. The fact is that the Kansas city chiefs have a phenomenal schedule, the home schedule this year. Do you want to put Philadelphia over there? No. You want to put Cincinnati over there? No. You want to put Buffalo over there? No. So the next team, as you looked at it last April, when they're making the schedule is Miami. And you have to ask yourself, okay, the question is, right, do you want to basically say that we'll be sure that Tua is going to be healthy then? And we will take, because Tua hasn't been healthy for a full season, so do you want to just say, okay, he's going to be healthy? Or do you want to say, we're going to take a team that deserves to play its way into a really good game like the kickoff game, like Detroit did. Uh, And, and, and look, I'm going to make this one point that is going to sound dumb right now. Detroit beat Kansas city on opening day. And you could say that Detroit's not as good as Miami. And maybe you'd be right. But I would say that Miami has not beaten anybody this year. Every team that they've beaten has a losing record. Mm. Detroit, Detroit has, has a better resume right now than, than Miami does. So I'm not saying you'd rather see Detroit, but I am saying Detroit has outperformed the Miami Dolphins so far. So I understand nobody wants that game to be there, but it makes a lot of sense to me about why it is there. NFL insider Peter King with us. Before you go, Peter, I'm going to I'm going to read off some names and I bet you know where I'm going to go here. Mike McDaniel, Robert Sala, D'Amico Ryans, Rand Carthon, Mike McGlinchey. The 49ers are building up on a yearly basis all of these third round comp picks. Today they used one to get Chase Young and they'll probably get it right back if and when he leaves in free agency. What's your take on how the 49ers are playing this because this certainly seems to be more than just dumb luck well the 49ers understand how to beat how to use the system and they have basically said to get chase young it costs us one draft cycle and about it's going to cost them, I would think, uh, you know, maybe it's going to cost them a few slots in the third round. I'm assuming that Chase Young will bring back a third round compensatory pick. He probably will when he goes into free agency. The question becomes when you look at it, okay, the question becomes it's going to come a year later and is it worth it? to have a really good player on your team for three months. I think it is. I understand why people might not, but I think it is. And the one other thing I would say about all this is that if you look at how the Baltimore Ravens have gamed the system for, I'd say, 10 or 12 years, because they've had more comp picks than anybody They have learned, do not be emotional about your people. Let them go because you're going to get something good back. And if you trust Adam Peters, if you trust your scouting department, don't worry about it. And over and over again, I think the 49ers have been proven right in that way. 
Peter, wonderful stuff always. We already are counting down to when we get to uh, talk to you next week, and uh, and hopefully the Ohio State and Brock Purdy questions didn't uh, <laughs> didn't ruin your night. Hey, all the best, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, all right, Peter. There it is. That was Odyssey NFL insider Peter King. Football morning in America. Yeah, Peter came in hot. He he had he wanted to know what gives.